Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The County Seat. I'm your host, Chad Booth. Uh, we are privileged today to have the State Director of the Bureau of Land Management as our sole guest for the next half an hour. Now, Director Palma, I've let people know in the counties that you were going to be my guest on the show, and I've had a, a very long list of topics that they said, please talk to them about this. So this is our chance to sit down and have a really candid and frank conversation about some of these issues, and I appreciate you taking the time to join us for them. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Chad, for having me on the program. I appreciate it. You know, we, we covered the issue back in March about Beaver and Iron County and wild horses. And there was no doubt out when we went out on the range and did a field trip that the areas where the horses were, were was really overgrazed. And you could tell the difference uh, between that land and the cattle land. And much to my surprise, I'd found that the cattle had not been on that area where the horses were for three years, but it still was decimated. By your own numbers, you're, you're way over the number of horses that should be on the range. Um, without looking back on how we got here, um, you know, Iron County says, you don't do it, we're going to. What's the BLM planning to do on this issue? Well, as you know, Chad, we and the BLM have a multiple use mission, which means that we serve many publics, uh, including the ranching community, recreation community, and a whole host of other communities. Our mission is broad and it's not sometimes easy to implement, but as it relates to wild horses, we clearly have a mandate by law that we need to take care of those wild horses. We have set aside some parts of our landscape for those wild horses. We call those horse management areas. In this part of the state, uh, Beaver and Iron Counties, we do have some horse management areas where we do have some wild horses. By law also, we have a number of horses we can have on those horse management areas. What we are, the problem today is that we are a little bit over what we need to be on those horses. So the question remains is, what can we do to bring those to, comp to the level that we need to be at? We call that appropriate management level. And one of the things that we're doing is we are going to do some gathers uh, this summer. We are going to do some gathers there. In addition to that, we're going to have some adoptions. They're going to be in Cedar City. We're going to have some adoptions there as well. And those are the things that we can do. We can also implement some other measures that we can do. What is, what is making this problem even more, more problematic than it normally could be is that that part of the state of Utah is about 40% of annual rainfall this year. And so there's simply drought all over that part of the, of the state. And so we're hoping that uh, Mother Nature will help us out as well, that there will be some rain that will fall in that part of the state in this few months. This is the time of the year when things green up, grasses grow. And so we, I still remain optimistic that we'll be able to do that. How long do you think it's going to take to fix the problem? This problem isn't going to be solved overnight. We didn't get here overnight. Mm -hmm. It's taken us a while to get here. So we are developing an environmental assessment for gathering some of those horses in Beaver and Iron County that will be a 10-year process where we can be able to come in and gather some this year. We might be able to gather some in the years to come. And so I believe that it's going to take us a while to solve this problem. We're just not going to be able to do it overnight. Are your hands administratively tied in this task uh, because um, of what you can do with the horses? I mean, your, your adoption program has not been as successful as you uh, wanted, and, and the adoption levels haven't been very high. Um, there have been reports that some of the horses that have been adopted out end up back on the range because people can't take care of them. I don't know how much that is. That's probably a fairly small number. Uh, but also the holding pens in the places across the country are already at capacity. Um, you know, if you gather the horses, then, then what are you going to do? Um, because it looks like your options are limited. Well, some of the things that we're looking at, we are actually <clears throat> asking the National Science Academy and others to help us with scientific uh, studies. For example, we believe that there is an opportunity for contraception. That's an area that we think we have an opportunity to be able to introduce contraception to some of the wild horses, and they can uh, be able to then manage the, the herds a little bit better through that method of contraception. I think most of our citizens are aware that we do that with some of our wonderful pets, mm -hmm. where we do contraception with our pets. Uh, we just need to do more research on, on the wild horses. So that's one area that I think it's open for further study and research. Uh, and certainly I think adoptions are still a viable option, especially some of this herds in this part of Utah. Uh, people that know wild horses know that these are special horses, 
And so I think that if we market these adoptions more, uh, we'll be able to do more adoptions in the future. Uh, but, uh, but I believe that clearly one of the problems that we have is that we don't have any more room left, both short-term and long-term holding facilities where we can hold these wild horses right now. And that's really one of our problems that we have. The other thing that we have is that we need some help from Congress too. You know, they need to be able to give us more tools to be able to use uh, as we try to manage this problem of wild horses. And so we're going to need some help from local citizens, local elected officials, which is a topic we'll take up when we come back here on the county seat. We'll be right back. Color. It's something that can be seen. But have you ever wanted to reach out and touch it? Experience it. In San Juan County, Utah color comes to life like nowhere else on earth. Color can be more than an abstract. Color can be your gateway to a new world. Visit San Juan County and explore the past, present, and future in a way that you've only dreamed of. San Juan County, color your experience. Anything worth doing in this quiet little town? You strike me as the kind of girl that likes a manicure and a massage. I was hoping for something a little more vigorous. Vigorous, I can do. And I thought you'd be riding side saddle. What? I'm gonna regret this. ATV? Check. Four-wheel driving? Check. Bouldering? Check. Mountain biking? Check. Hiking? Check. River rafting? Check. Adventure is about more than just crossing activities off of a list, but hey, if you can find a place that gives you everything you're looking for, all the better. In Emory County, you'll find the San Rafael Swell, trails, lakes, and the small town hospitality you're looking for. San Rafael Country, in the heart of Utah. Visit us and check something off your list. Kanab, base camp for your Southern Utah adventures. in Kanab. Welcome back to the county seat. We are spending our half hour today with Juan Palma, who's the director of the Bureau of Land Management. We spent our first block talking about wild horses and you really had one more comment that you wanted to make in reference to the fact that the counties are a little bit bellicose right now and saying, you know, if you don't get them, we're gonna go get them. Um, your comments on that. Well, I just wanted to mention on that question, you know, what happens if uh, local citizens or others go out and get those horses? I just want to remind our citizens that the law is pretty clear that the wild horses cannot be harassed or gathered by citizens. Now, we can work together in partnership, and we, the BLM, are more than happy to partner with local entities to find solutions. But I, I would ask that uh, citizens don't go out and gather the horses themselves. Because you don't want to have to uh, arrest them and litigate against them, yeah. I guess. We don't want to get into that, that discussion or that world. Gee, I can't think of any recent examples where that went wrong anywhere. <laughs> right. well, let's shift our direction over to the other side of the state. Uh, short, about the time you actually were put in as the state director, you, you landed in your new job with a controversy where the secretary had withdrawn a whole bunch of uh, energy-related uh, leases uh, down in, in Grand County. And since then, they've decided, or you've decided, to come up with a master leasing plan to lay over the resource management plan. Um, a lot of counties feel like that's a, a, a renig of the resource management plan down in the area, and there's some frustration about it. So I would like to have a little bit of a conversation about the Grand County Master Leasing Plan from your perspective. Well, well, let me just first of all say, Ted, that as far as oil and gas development in Utah, Utah BLM is either number one or right at number one across the nation for oil and gas approvals of, of permits. So we clearly are doing something good as far as Utah. And when you look at <clears throat> Vernal or you go to Roosevelt or other parts of the eastern part of the Uinta Basin, you'll see a lot of activity. In fact, I don't have to tell people, they, they can see it visually. A lot of activity going on. Much of that is approvals coming out of the BLM land. So something is going on in the eastern part of the state that I think is important. 
I know the governor is very uh, concerned, was concerned about this. We've made tremendous progress. As it relates to leasing reform, which a part component of that is master leasing plans, we feel that like any other local community, local county who has a master plan, we need to think about us in Utah in the BLM lands. Where is it appropriate that we ought to be able to lease and where is it not? And where is it that we ought to have certain measures as we lease some of these lands for development? For example, should we lease a parcel where there's no roads, there's no pipelines, there's no infrastructure at all? That's a question that I think citizens will ask themselves. Is it appropriate for us to lease that? Or can we wait there for a little longer? Master leasing plan is about taking a holistic view on what is appropriate for us to lease right now and what might be appropriate for us to wait a little longer to lease until further down the road. And so master leasing plan is a process by which we have engaged the citizens and be able to talk about how, must, how could we balance the resources that we manage out there, recreation resources, the river resources that we have like the Colorado River resources, and also how do we manage this fossil fuel that we have here in Utah, which is oil and gas development. And, and so master leasing plan is to, for us to be able to find a balance amongst all those uses. There's a lot of other mineral extraction uh, that uh, is of great concern and that there's demand for. And I know that Northern San Juan County is very concerned that this master leasing plan is going to have a negative impact on that. Yeah, and you know, I think what you're referring to, Ted, is that there's potash, potash exactly. development that could exactly. occur in that part of, the, of that, what is called the Paradox Basin. The one thing that we can talk about is that it, it took millions of years to create this wonderful scenic landscapes that we all appreciate in Utah. And not only us in Utah, but all over the world. People come from all over the world to see what Mother Nature has done. And some say, you know, and I, I believe that handiwork of God has created these magnificent places in the eastern part of the state. And I, all you have to do is stand up at that horse point and see around you and see these magnificent creations in that part of the state. And so because it's taken so long to create these beautiful landscapes, these majestic places, then I think it's important that we take a little time to be able to see where should development occur and where can we not impact some of those magnificent places like Eastern Utah. I think it's appropriate that we take a little time to have a thoughtful meditative planning process to arrive at a conclusion that perhaps we can find that balance amongst all the resources. San Juan County would look at that and say, well, taking time is good, but our county's hungry right now, and this is, a, this is a possibility for them to improve the quality of life of citizens there. And that's a very appropriate question that the counties would ask. What we have done with certain companies, we develop memorandums of agreement mm -hmm. that they can begin to explore. In fact, exploration is going on right now with certain companies in northern San Juan County, and the southern part of Grand County. And so we have accommodated some of these companies who are very serious, interested in development for potash, and we have developed this memorandum of agreement so that they can begin the exploration phase because they themselves don't know exactly how much and where is it that mm -hmm. this potash may be. On the Richfield RMP, you recently ended up in a court settlement uh, and or a, a, a legal challenge that now is directing you to go back and instead of doing an area uh, inventory of the tr transportation system, you have to do a mile by mile. How are you going to achieve it and what's going to be the rule of law in the meantime? Right now, the current resource management plan guides. Th that doesn't change at this moment in time. And the litigation is in play right now, so there's, I don't know the outcome of what's going to come at the end of this litigation. So it'd be premature for me to say, I can only second guess what may occur, which is not appropriate for me to do. But all I can tell you is that we are working with a number of parties to be able to find solutions to this, uh, to this issue of litigation in the original IMP. But I wanna make sure that our, that our listeners hear from me and understand that until such time as a, a decision comes about, the current RMP guides all of the actions out there right now. Well, you know, I've picked on you so far in this segment about land in that neck of the woods, and, and it's uh, unfair to talk about all the challenges without talking about some of the successes. So I would like to turn our attention to the Utah Recreational Land Exchange, where there are some very scenic properties in, in Grand County that are being exchanged for properties that are a little bit more productive on mineral side. And, and we're excited. I mean, I'm excited because after four and a half years, we are about to conclude uh, real soon a uh, 
land exchange, we're going to exchange uh, roughly 35, uh, 25, 35,000 acres from BLM lands with CITLA lands, the uh, State Inst Institutional Trust lands. And what it is that we, the BLM, will acquire the parcels around Moab from CITLA, and then CITLA will acquire some of the parcels in the Uinta Basin from the BLM. We think that's a win-win for all the parties. We'll be able to conserve for the citizens of Utah and the world some of these beautiful parcels in Moab, and then CITLA will get some of the parcels in the Uinta Basin. We think that's a win-win, and we're excited to be able to uh, finally conclude this. It took a little while, but you have to, we're talking a lot of acres and we're talking a lot of complications along the way. Well, thank you for uh, staying with us. We'll be back. We've got more to talk about with Director Palma at the BLM. Uh, you know what? If you're finding that we're addressing some issues that have long sought some conversation, get on the phone, call your friends, tell them to turn on the TV set, and we'll see you back here right after a commercial break. Unlimited opportunity for adventure? It's all about knowing where to look. ATV adventures, rock crawling events, art festivals, and wildlife events. The opportunities are limitless. Pick your adventure in Millard County. There are a couple great things about the Uinta Basin. One is it's still small, it's a community. That makes you feel like when you go somewhere, you know everybody. When you know your neighbor, and your neighbor knows you, and you can trust each other, people look out for one another. I grew up in the Uinta Basin, and I think that it's a good place to raise a family. So we packed up our three kids, and here we came to Uinta County, and what a great place it was. It's not too big, it's not too small. And, and it has a lot to offer that you just don't get in the big city anymore. You go through the day-to-day -day repeating what you did yesterday. Don't you wish you could access that piece of your life that's missing? Find the beauty, serenity, family fun, or anything else that's missing from your life in the Cedar City Bryan Head area. Gain access to your adventure, whether it's camping, hiking, the arts, festivals, or just a getaway. Visit scenicsouthernutah.com for details on all the adventures that you can access in scenic southern Utah. Landscapes as diverse as the people who venture to find them await. All you have to do is find a place to begin. Moab, Utah, in Grand County, where adventure begins. Welcome back to the County Seat. Our conversation today with Director Juan Palma, who is the State Director for the Bureau of Land Management. We kind of left at a litigatory question about Richfield RMP. I would like to go into that because where you ended up with uh, being blindsided by this uh, lawsuit, and I, and I do believe the agency was blindsided because it looked like you had everything in play. We'd gone through eight years of resource management plan. I would like to talk about how litigation messes up what the BLM does, if, if I may be so uh, bold. I would like to talk to you in, in specific uh, about what kind of resource uh, requirements these lawsuits have and how much of a nuisance are they. Litigation certainly takes away our focus <clears throat> from all the great work that we need to add, do for our citizens here in Utah. But it's a reality of our democracy where litigation is part of what people can and should invoke if they feel so passionately about an issue. And, and so, but it's, in terms of the scope of litigation for us in the BLM in Utah, we certainly get a lot. And, and our listeners may think that it's only coming from one side, but it isn't. I, we get litigation from all sides. We have litigation from citizens, litigation from non-governmental organizations, litigation from governmental organizations, from all sides we get litigation. And that's because they feel very passionately about the issues that we have. It does take our focus away from the things that we need to do on behalf of the citizens. It, what is the cost of all this litigation? I, I cannot tell you a specific dollar amount, but it's in the millions. But I cannot give you, there's a lot of staff that get, our staff that get involved in producing the documents and getting the documents ready and getting the package ready. And so it does take an awful lot of our time and, and cost. 
One of the things that I believe also adds to our cost is that we have a lot of requests for Freedom of Information Act documents. Mm -hmm. And those can be in the thousands of documents. That takes time to research those documents, to put them all together, to provide them to the citizens. But again, I want to remind us all that that is all part of our democracy. It is all part of our transparency to provide these documents to the citizens. And yes, it takes time. And yes, it takes money. And litigation certainly takes even more time and money than that. But that's part of what is available for redress of our citizens. Hopefully, we'll be able to avoid litigation as much as possible by collaborating and sitting down with those people that have issues. At the end of the day, you know, we, we the BLM in Utah, do talk and do collaborate with many, many entities to avoid litigation at all costs, if at all possible. Well, we've talked about all the problems. We're going to talk about some of the victories when we come back on the county seat. We'll be back in a minute. Why is it that environmental protection and economic development are often placed at odds with each other? Well, in Duchesne County, they have both. Here, modern industry and resource development go hand in hand with some of the most pristine wilderness in the western United States. A strong economy balanced with a lifestyle of exploration and discovery. But don't take my word for it. Go visit them. Duchesne County, close enough for business. Far enough, get away. Place that is beyond words. There is nothing to be said. Except take your time in Bryce Canyon Country. Welcome back to the county seat. Director Palmer, we've been uh, we've been pretty pointed with you and, and asked you some tough questions today and appreciate your candor on it. Uh, I, I do think that it's fair that I give you a chance to talk about your victories because we on this show talk all the time about the places we think you're coming up short. Where's the BLM been winning? Ted, I'm glad you asked the question. And I wanna let the listeners know that there's a lot of great things the BLM is doing here in Utah. And I just mentioned oil and gas operations. We're number one, or really close to number one in oil development across the entire nation for the BLM. That's a real positive thing that we do for the state of Utah. Our recreation program, we host nearly six million visitors across all of the BLM in Utah. That's important for all of our citizens and our visitors that come to the state. We have over 1.1 million cattle that is permitted on BLM lands. That's an awful lot of AUMs, a lot of cattle are permitted on BLM lands. We have a number of other issues. We provide great fire support to our citizens here in Utah. You know, when the fire bell rings, we want to be ready to respond. So we have aircraft, we have our fi our forces that are on the ground. That's an important value add to all of our citizens that we provide for them. And we want to continue all of those things and more in partnership with um, our governor, who him and I speak on a every so often basis. And I think him and I are on the same page. We want to be able to sit at the table, negotiate as hard and as often as we can to find solution to the problems. So I think that's important that we continue that for the state. Do you of think more of that could be done in management prior to the fire? Uh, we can, and we should continue to do more of that. And we're doing that as we speak right now to work together with the state us, the BLM, the Forest Service, and others, to provide value add to our citizens and protection for their homes and property. We talked about some of the land exchanges already, but the, I want to talk briefly about another law that I've used many, many times, and that is called the Recreation and Public Purposes Act, RMPP for short. 
And what that is is an, a law that allows us to work with communities and counties to provide BLM land for schools, for parks, for other kinds of uh, facilities such as the infrastructure that the counties or cities may need. We've done several of those, especially in Washington County. In fact, I've been down there several times to, to do RMPP leases, which is $10 an acre, for several of the jurisdictions down in Washington County, but other ones as well. For example, we just concluded uh, in uh, the Price area, Emory County, a shooting range, which we, the BLM, provided for the county to be able to provide safety and as far as shooting uh, range for them. And we're working on some other ones across the state that we're providing for the citizens of Utah. Those are some of the things that sometimes you don't hear about in the newspapers, but it really is a value add to all of our citizens across the state. Very good, thank you. We've got, we've got just a very little time left. Uh, transfer of public lands is the gorilla that's sitting on the shelf. It's been a topic on this show a lot. Um, what, when you see this happening in the state, what are your thoughts? You know, public lands for me are such an important part of my life. And I believe it's an important part of a lot of citizens' lives. Our memories go back to those days where we remember something when we were children. For me, it's a remembrance as a migrant child working in the Sacramento Valley of, of California and looking up the Sierra Nevada and seeing that beautiful landscape. And I remember traveling north to the state of Washington and they used to move us in trucks when they moved us back in those days when I was a child. And I remember looking up in the distance seeing these beautiful landscapes in my, later in my life, I came to realize what I was looking at was the Three Sister Peaks in Central Oregon. And I thought to myself, when I was going along there as a child, I thought that's gotta be like heaven. Public lands for me have been a transformational part of my life. And so I really believe that public lands must be so in, the, in this wonderful country of ours. We need to continue to have public lands because I believe that there's many, many of us that when we touch public lands, there's something that happens inside of all of us. And so for me, it's about really doing our part to continue to have and protect the public lands that we have. So your response to the transfer of public lands as far as the state goes? You know, that's a question that's gonna to have to be resolved at another level than mine. But I would say to me that to all of our citizens, we must have public lands, uh, whether federal or otherwise, we need to have public lands, I believe because that's our legacy that we'll leave behind for generations to come. Director Palmer, thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate your coming on the show. Thank you. I hope you'll come back again. And I will. Maybe we can arrange an hour so we can get everything in in one session. That'd be great. All right, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you for watching The County Seat. Check us out on our website. You can make comments there on our Facebook page. We'll look for you next week. AYL wants you to win the trip of a lifetime. Sign up now on Facebook to win a Caribbean cruise on MSC Cruise Lines. Go to AYLTV.com for more details and watch At Your Leisure Saturday nights at 1030 and Sunday mornings at 9 on ABC4 Utah. If you like this video, then we invite you to subscribe to our channel, The County Seat. You can do that here. And we invite you to share with your friends. We also invite you to get all the latest up-to-date information by following us on our social media channels. And if all else fails, make sure that you watch the county seat Sunday morning at 8.30 right here on ABC4 Utah.